You're watching a message from Dr. Jim Dixon, founding senior pastor of Cherry Hills Community Church. Jim studied the scriptures, history, and current events to prepare purposeful and insightful sermons. Enjoy this sermon and be blessed. Today we are going to have a Lenten message as we are looking forward to Easter. Our subject is sin, and we're going to go back to where the problem of sin began, and we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 3. So our scripture is taken from Genesis chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. <clears throat> now the serpent was more subtle, more crafty, than any other creature which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman replied, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, Of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat, neither or neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said, You will not die. For God knows, in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that it was to be desired so as to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate, and she gave some to her husband, and he ate. And at once their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife sought to hide themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And God called to the man, saying, Where are you? The man said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat of it? And the man replied, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of its fruit, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this thing which you have done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this thing, cursed are you above all cattle and above every wild animal. On your belly you shall go dust, you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman between her seed and your seed. He shall crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And to Adam, God said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and partaken of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Well, the man called his wife's name Eve, for she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin to clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. 
And now lest he reach forth his hand and take also of the tree of light, life and eat and live forever. Therefore, he sent the man forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And on the east end of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This ends the reading from God's holy word. Let's pray together before we have our message this morning. <clears throat> Dear Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would convict us each one. And Lord, that by convicting us, you would bless us. May the words of my mouth and may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Today, we are in the middle of what is called the Lenten season. The Lenten season begins with Ash Wednesday, and it extends all the way to Easter Sunday. It is a time of preparation for the worship experience of Easter itself. The word Lenten comes from the word Lent, which means spring, and of course, the Lenten season leads into spring, but it has little to do with spring. What it has to do with is sin. The Lenten season is all about sin. On Ash Wednesday, in many Christian traditions, the priest or the minister places ashes on the forehead of the believer as a reminder of sin, that we are dust and to dust we will return, and that we are to repent in sackcloth and ashes. And through the 40 days of Lent, some Christians participate in prayer and fasting because of their sin. And during those same 40 days, many Christians participate in a kind of modified fast where they deny themselves something they really love as a token of their consecration to Christ and their sincere sorrow for sin. And of course, it all leads to Good Friday when we come to the cross we celebrate the death of Christ and substitutionary atonement for sin. It's all about sin. Many non-Christians and even a few Christians want to know, well, why is God so concerned with sin? And so this morning, I would like us to take a 3D look at sin. Actually, I want us to take a 4D look at sin I want to talk about the four D's of sin. And the first D is disobedience. Sin is all about disobedience. And we see this even in Genesis chapter 3, our passage of Scripture for today. Sin is disobedience. It has to do with not doing what God has told you to do, or with doing what God has told you not to do. Sin is always disobedience to God. And in the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says everyone who commits sin is guilty of disobedience, for sin is disobedience. Now, the Greek word there for disobedience is anomia. And that word literally means lawlessness. You see, sin is disobedience with regard to the laws of God. And how about you? Do you disobey the laws of God? Are you ever lawless, anomia? Well, in the Old Testament, there are three different types of law. Many Jews and Christians do not understand this. In the Old Testament, there are three different types of law. There's the judicial law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law. 
Now, the judicial law is no longer binding. The judicial law consisted of laws that were given to govern the nation of Israel, and those laws passed away with the passing of Old Testament Israel. The ceremonial laws are no longer binding because many of the ceremonial laws have been fulfilled in Christ and what hasn't been fulfilled in Christ has been repealed in the New Testament. For instance, the ceremonial law consists of the laws regulating the Jewish purification rites. Those laws were fulfill, fulfilled in Christ. The ceremonial law consists of the laws regulating the Jewish sacrificial system. Those laws were fulfilled in Christ as he became the Lamb of God who was sacrificed for the sin of the world. The ceremonial laws consisted of the laws that regulated the priesthood, and those laws are all fulfilled in Christ, the New Testament tells us, because Christ is once and for all our great high priest. And the ceremonial laws consist of the Levitical dietary laws, and those laws have been repealed in the New Testament. So what remains? What remains from the Old Testament is the moral law. The moral law, and the New Testament is very clear that the moral law is still binding on us. And the moral law is centered on the Decalogue. It's centered on the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are still binding on us as Christians, not as a means of salvation, but as a standard of righteousness. As a standard of righteousness, the moral law is still binding and much of what is written in the Old Testament is written to explain to us what the Ten Commandments really require and when we come to the New Testament, as we have seen in the last few months in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ wants us to understand the full implications of the Decalogue, the moral law. And he tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that the moral law really begins in our heart. It begins in your heart, in my heart. And by that standard, we are all disobedient. We are all without law. Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman with lust in his heart or with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. You've heard it said of old, you shall not kill. Whoever kills will be liable for judgment. I say to you, Whoever looks upon his brother or sister with anger will be liable for judgment. So by the standards of Christ, the moral law condemns all of us. We're all disobedient in our thoughts, in our motives, if not in our actions. We are all disobedient. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. So we have this first D concerning sin, disobedience. Sin is disobedient, disobedience, and we are all disobedient. We all sin. Well, the second D of sin is deception. It is deception. Now, my wife, Barb, grew up in a wonderful Christian family with wonderful parents. But they were very fundamentalistic in their Christian faith, and they had some pretty strict ideas. And at Christmas time, in Barb's family, nobody ever talked about Santa Claus. You weren't supposed to talk about Santa Claus. In fact, Barb's dad always called Santa Claus the great deceiver the great deceiver. That didn't make Christmas a whole lot of fun. <laughs> of course, the Bible tells us that it is the devil who is the great deceiver, not Santa Claus. I am reminded of a story of two children who came out of their second grade Sunday school class where they just heard about the devil for the very first time. And one little boy said to the other boy, well, what do you think? What do you think of this devil stuff? And the other boy said, well, you know how it was with Santa Claus. It'll probably just turn out to be your dad. 
But of course, <clears throat> biblically, we know that's not so. <clears throat> the devil is not your dad, and the devil is not Santa Claus. Neither is the devil a mythological creation of uneducated and ignorant people. It's not a, the, the devil is not a fabrication. <clears throat> he is not the mere personification of evil, as many liberal theologians would lead us to believe. The devil actually exists. The Bible makes that clear. Jesus makes that clear. The devil exists. We would be naive to deny that evil exists in this world, and we would be naive to deny that evil exists on a supernatural level. The devil exists, and he is the deceiver. Jesus tells us he is a liar, and he is the father of lies. And we see in Eden, in Genesis chapter 3, we see how he seeks to deceive Adam and Eve, and how he would have them to believe that sin, disobedience to God, will actually lead to enlightenment. That's what he tells them. Sin will actually lead to enlightenment. Your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. But it's a lie. Because he is the deceiver. It is a lie. Now I know that many of you have heard of Tantalus and Greek mythology, Tantalus was the son of Zeus. In Roman theology, Tantalus was the son of Jupiter. He was the king of Lydia. He was condemned, he was judged by the gods because he murdered his own son. And being condemned, he was sentenced to live forever in Hades, in the underworld where he was made to stand in the river Styx. And in that river, the water came up to his chin. And above his head, there was a cliff, and upon that cliff, a fruit tree. And the branches of that fruit, fruit tree descended, so the fruit was just above his head. The water below his head, the fruit above his head. And he would hunger and thirst. But whenever Tantalus tried to drink, whenever he would dip his head, the water would descend, it would recede, so that it was always just beyond his reach. Whenever he'd become hungry and he would reach for the fruit, the wind would blow and the fruit would blow away just beyond his reach. And so it was forever and ever and ever that he never found fulfillment. He never found satisfaction. And of course, we get the English word in our language, we get the English word tantalize from the Greek mythological character of Tantalus. I hope you understand Satan loves to tantalize. <clears throat> he loves to tantalize. He never offers fulfillment, or he does offer it, but he never delivers it. <laughs> He never gives you satisfaction. He entices you to sin, but sin never fulfills. He entices you to sin, but sin never satisfies. He wants you to think that it will lead you to satisfaction. And whatever sin tempts you, Satan wants you to think that you'll find happiness through it. He wants the world to think that it will find happiness through materialism or through hedonism, or through self-ascension and egoism. And he has sold the world a lie. And the world's bought it. But the world never finds satisfaction. The world never finds fulfillment because, you see, it's all deception. Sin is deception. The second D of sin, disobedience, deception. Now the third D, the third D is really kind of a double D, death and destruction. Sin leads to death and destruction. Now, on February the 9th, in the year 1855, a strange thing happened in Devon, England. 
It was on that day in the year 1855 that it snowed in Devon. And in the county of Devon, sometimes called Devonshire, it rarely snows. I mean, if you know the map of England, you know that the county of Devon or Devonshire is on the southwest peninsula of England. It is lower than London, England, and far westward. And it virtually never snows there, but it did on February 9, 1855. And the Exe River, near the town of Exeter, froze over that night. And the next morning, when the children looked out of their houses, the snow covered the ground. And the children went out to play, and the adults went to work. But they all noticed something unusual. They noticed unusual footprints in the snow, cloven hoofed footprints in the snow. Now, of course, goats have cloven hoofs, but these footprints were far larger than goat prints. And they weren't the footprints of a quadruped. They weren't the footprints of a four-legged animal. They were the footprints of a two-legged animal, and that's the problem. There are no cloven-hoofed two-legged animals. No such animal. And yet here they were, footprints in the snow, and as the people in Devon began to examine these footprints, they saw, incredibly, that the footprints went for 100 miles. They went for 100 miles in a straight line. Whenever the footprints came to a house or a building, instead of going around the house, they just went right up the side of the wall and then over the roof. For 100 miles, an incredible mystery. The word spread, scientists came from the city of London trying to figure this out. Nobody could figure it out. Of course, the religious community, the clergy, the ecclesiastical authorities, they examined it. And they concluded that Satan, the devil, had walked in Devon. And of course, according to mythological imagery, the devil is a cloven, hoofed, bipodal being. But that's just mythology. Nevertheless, that was the conclusion of the clergy. And today, nobody knows. To this day, nobody knows what happened in Devon that night of February 9th, 1855. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, it doesn't matter because probably it was just a trickster. Probably it was just somebody pulling off some kind of trick. But you see, even if it was the devil, even if the devil did walk in Devon as the headlines of the New York Times said in 1855, even if the devil did that, it really doesn't matter. Because that's not what the devil's all about. See, the devil's not about footprints in the snow. He's not about walking up the sides of buildings. What the devil's all about is death and destruction. That's what he seeks in your life. That's what he seeks in my life. The devil seeks the destruction of your soul. He, he seeks your destruction, body and soul. And we see this in Genesis 3. We see this in Genesis 3 as, as sin leads to destruction and death. It leads, first of all, to relational destruction. Sin leads to relational destruction. On the vertical, it leads to a broken relationship with God. And so the man and his wife seek to hide themselves amongst the trees of the garden, hiding themselves in the presence of the Lord God, the relationship broken because of sin. And on the horizontal, the relationship between the man and the woman was broken as they each begin to blame each other because of sin. Sin breaks relationships. It leads to relational destruction. You may have seen that in your marriage or at work or in some other context. Sin leads to relational destruction. It also leads to emotional destruction because sin brings guilt. Sin brings guilt. And if you don't deal with that guilt, guilt leads to despair. 
You see, sin leads to emotional destruction. It also leads to physical destruction. I mean, sin can actually begin to destroy us physically. The Bible says in the fifth chapter of James that many people are afflicted with illnesses and disease, diseases that are caused by sin. When Jesus healed people, as you go through the Gospels many times, after healing somebody, Jesus would say to that person, your sin has forgiven you. Because Jesus saw a link between sin and illness. Now the Bible is clear that not all illness is caused by sin. So when you see somebody who's sick, you don't want to judge them as having participated in some gross sin. But there can be a link there. And even science and medicine proves that there is a link between sin and disease. And we as a culture and a nation are riddled with sexually transmitted diseases today because of sin. With chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, AIDS. And it's really all because of inappropriate sexual conduct. I mean, the Bible is very clear that sin is this incredibly wonderful gift. Excuse me, sin. Sex. <laughs> sex is this incredibly wonderful gift. And sex is a gift that's meant to be opened only within the context of marriage. It becomes sin when it's opened outside of the context of marriage. It also becomes dangerous. And it can lead to physical destruction. When we are not monogamous, sex is very dangerous. And of course, even doctors and scientists tell us this, sin leads to destruction on the physical level. Of course, sin leads to destruction on the spiritual level. As Adam and Eve were banned from the garden, sin can lead to destruction on the economic level. As corporate greed can lead to corporate downfalls and stockholders are devastated, sin destroys. Sin leads to destruction and death. You know, I'm I'm reminded of, of a story I, I read not too long ago. It's a true story. It was in the newspaper about a guy in Chicago who was a car thief. And he was really trying to quit. I mean, he'd been apprehended before and even incarcerated. He knew he had to quit. But he loved cars. And he loved the thrill of, the thrill of stealing, stealing things. He, he loved the thrill of theft. Well, one day he's walking down the street in Chicago... And he sees a beautiful, brand new Toyota 4Runner. And this was his favorite car. And it was brand new in exactly the color he loved. And he thought, oh, I can't steal a car again. But he just, you know, was really drawn to this car. And so he began to look inside and he was stunned to see the keys were in the ignition. True story. Keys were in the ignition. Some guy had just left the keys in his ignition in some hurry or something and gone into a building. Well, this thief thought, you know, this is just too good to be true. He gets into the car, turns the key, starts ignition, and begins to start out. But what he didn't know was that Toyota 4Runner was owned by an animal trainer. And according to the newspapers, in the back seat, sound asleep, was a full-grown leopard. And this guy goes about a block and hits a bump, and the leopard wakes up and suddenly just jumps off with this ferocious roar. And this thief loses it. I mean, he loses control of the car and just crashes into a wall. Apprehended, convicted, incarcerated. He says he's cured. <laughs> he says he'll never do it again. Now, when you think about it, sin, sin is a lot like a new car. A lot like a new car to a thief. I mean, it's alluring. It's attractive. Sin is like that. 
But you see, there's always a leopard in the back seat. That's how Satan has set the whole deal up. There's always a leopard in the back seat. The Bible says that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Death and destruction, that's what he's all about. And he really wants your soul. He wants your unrepentant sin to lead to soul death. He wants you to participate in the greatest sin of all, which is unbelief. He wants your soul. He wants you to experience physical death, separation of your soul from the body, and then spiritual death, separation of your soul from God. But you see, fortunately, there's a fourth D in this message on sin. And the fourth D is deliverance. God offers to deliver you from sin. God offers to deliver me from sin. To deliver us from disobedience, deception, destruction, and death. In Psalm 51, David, after his sin with Bathsheba, cries out, Deliver me, O God, from blood guiltiness, my God of my salvation, then my mouth will cry aloud, sing aloud of your deliverance. We all want to be delivered from death and destruction. And God offers that. God offers that through Christ. Jesus came into the world to deliver us from sin and from death. And there's a passage of Scripture that is so precious with this regard. And that is 1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, where we read these words. This is the message we've heard from the beginning. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children. I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the expiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sin of the whole world. The deliverer, Jesus Christ. And it all begins, deliverance all begins with confession. When you're willing to come into the light, when you're willing to walk out of the darkness and into the light and confess your sinfulness. That's where deliverance begins. I know that uh, many of you, perhaps most of you, have read Gulliver's Travels. It was written in the 18th century by Jonathan Swift. Gulliver's Travels is, of course, a masterpiece of literature. And children just love to read Gulliver's Travel. Sometimes adults are kind of disturbed by it because they understand the deeper meanings, the allegories, the symbolism. In Gulliver's Travels, we're told that Gulliver took four journeys. And the first journey was to the land of the Lilliputians. And the Lilliputians were, were little people, one-twelfth the size of normal people. That was Gulliver's first journey, and on his second journey, Gulliver went to the land of the Brobdenags, and they were giants, 12 times the size of normal people. On his third journey, he went to various lands and encountered various peoples. But every literary scholar agrees the most important journey in understanding Jonathan Swift, the most important journey was the fourth journey. And on the fourth journey, Gulliver traveled to a land where he saw two different types of beings. There were the Huinims, and the Huinims were kind, 
And they were gentle and they were wise. They were good. And they looked a lot like horses, the Huinims. And then there was another race of beings, and they were called the Yahoos. In fact, this is where in the English language we get the word Yahoo. We get it from Jonathan Swift and Gulliver's Travels. And the second group of beings were called the Yahoos. And they were not kind, and they were not gentle. They were not wise, and they were not good. They were sometimes mean, and they were sometimes stupid. They were often sinful. And the Yahoos looked a whole lot like human beings. So Gulliver didn't want to hang out with the Yahoos. He wanted to hang out with the Huinims. He wanted to hang out with the horse-like beings. But the Huinims didn't want Gulliver to join them because he looked a lot like a Yahoo. And you'll recall at the end of Gulliver's travels when he leaves that land and returns to the city of London, he no longer wants to hang out with people because they look like Yahoos. And he wants to hang out with the horses because they look like Huinims. And some people have actually concluded that Jonathan Swift, on the basis of Gulliver's travels, was a misanthrope, that he hated people. But they don't understand him at all. He didn't hate people. In fact, Jonathan Swift loved people. And for more than 30 years, he was the senior pastor of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, Ireland. For more than 30 years, the senior pastor, and he loved people. But you see, he understood the Bible. He understood that all people are yahoos. He understood that. He understood that we're all sinners in need of grace, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's something of the yahoo in all of us. He understood that. And do you understand that? That's the beginning of deliverance. When you understand that, at least in some measure, you are a yahoo. When I understand that, at least in some measure, I'm a yahoo, that's the beginning of deliverance. When you understand that you're a sinner in desperate need of grace, and you confess your sin, but confession's not enough. We must also, the Bible says, repent. Confession must be followed by repentance and repentance implies a sincere desire to change. And if you know you're a sinner, do you have a sincere desire to change? Your thought life, your motives, your behavior, do you have a sincere desire to change? That's repentance. But even that's not enough. Even confession and repentance, the Bible says, is not enough because we must have faith. We must come to the cross in faith. We must fall down at the foot of the cross and accept Christ. His bloodshed, his atoning sacrifice, his payment for our sin. We must come in faith, believing that his sacrifice is sufficient. And you see, when you see the gospel summarized in scriptures, in the scripture, it's always repent and believe. Confession is part of repentance. Repent and believe. So it's confess, repent, believe. That's the call of the gospel. And it's the means of deliverance. And when you do that, when you come to the cross, you receive Christ, Savior and Lord, he delivers you from your disobedience, from your deception, from destruction and death itself. That's deliverance. And you begin a whole new journey in sanctification and discipleship that leads to heaven itself. That's the offer of the gospel. And it is so wonderful. And as we close this morning, it's possible that there's people here who never found deliverance from sin, from disobedience, deception, destruction, and death. This is the morning to take care of that. So let's close this Lenten service with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the son of righteousness. You are holy. 
And Lord, you are the deliverer. You left your throne of glory. You came to Bethlehem. You took our flesh upon yourself. You lived a sinless life that you might provide the perfect sacrifice. And you died an atoning death. You died for us, taking our place, paying the penalty for our sin. Lord, if there's anyone here who has never found the deliverance you offer, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you're tugging in their heart and that they would have faith enough to say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I come to the foot of your cross and I kneel. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. I confess I am a sinner. And Lord, I repent. I want to change. I have not the power. Lord, deliver me. Be my Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Wash me whiter than snow. Forgive me. Deliver me from disobedience, deception, destruction, and death, and give me eternal life by your mercy and grace. Come, Lord Jesus. Sit on the throne of my heart. From this day forth, I want to follow you. Give me eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. When we pray that prayer, you do hear us. And you come in, and we are yours, and you are ours. You do not let us go. We love you. You are the deliverer. We pray these things in your great and matchless name. Amen.